You are now listening to Femme Regard Podcast with Tessa Markle and Carolina Alvarez. Mmm, Femme. Well, hello, Femme fam. Welcome back to another exciting episode. We have a guest on the show today. She is a writer, a producer, and the lead actress of Imposter, Miss Veronica Macari. And we just love a multi hyphenate actor, writer, producer, director. Guys, she's from Italy. She made it out here. She got work done for herself. And it's a very inspiring journey, I think, for you guys to listen to. But what we're excited to talk about today is her web series, Imposter, a six part short form dramedy series that investigates feminism in art when mixed with commerce and social media, raising questions about activism in art, as well as authenticity and creative license. So there's a lot jam packed into there and we get into it, but we haven't had a short form web series episodic type guest in, in quite a while. And their, their project has been sweeping the film festival circuit. I caught a trailer online, wasn't even in connection with Veronica uh, and I was blown away and I, uh, we started chatting more from there. So we got to see him because we were special like that. Hi, it's, it's done so well. And I thought we could, anyone who is, you know, trying to learn how to do an episodic, I think the way she went about it is such a great example. So get your notepad ready. There's going to be a lot of great ways on how to produce it, but also how she herself as a creator became involved. So I know you guys are going to love this one today and we're so excited to share it. Yes. And we were so excited that we got to see a little little private screener beforehand. Um, I cannot wait for you guys to get to watch it when they're done with the festival circuit, because literally like I texted Carolina when I was finished and I was like, (laughs) oh my God, I was like, this needs to be on TV right now. It's so good. So just, yeah, it's amazing. Like how much Because I think sometimes we think of web series as like, oh, like no budget, you just film it in your own apartment, like, you know, low quality sort of thing. And that's not always the case by any means. And this really proves that that like doesn't need to be the case. You know, they really put so much into it and it is such amazing quality. That's a great distinction, uh, Tessa, about, and not distinction, but kind of a personal prejudice Mm -hmm. that I have in my head and And that's not to say there are phenomenal web series out there, but maybe the ones we've kind of seen in the past and been around. I I mean, that's something I I told Veronica. I, I, you don't always expect to see such a high polished production. I mean, even from the film cards that they use in the intros and outros and the music, like it's very high quality. And I think kind of proves to us that you could do a web series format, really high quality, like a feature film and have something really strong to show for yourself. Um, So again, it it was just so cool to see that uh, from like a proof of concept to actualization, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm like so pumped for this. This is going to do so well. Like Netflix, you're listening because you should be from regard productions right Hello, podcast you're so missing good. out if you're not you're missing out if you're not <laughs> but guys um, even but, if you aren't interested yeah. in the web series world like there's so many great tips in here about just stuff in general like proof of concept how you are envisioning selling something budget and crowdfunding like it's not all just web series specific so please make yes. sure to listen through the whole episode for lots of inspiration and kind of tips and tricks and plus veronica's just a delight so <laughs> we know you guys are going to enjoy this one Exactly. I think it's so cool that I think the biggest takeaway is how similar the approach is for a feature or a, or a short form episodic series like this, that you still need to do the same kind of work and the same kind of setup. So guys, get ready. Pencils and papers. Enjoy the show. 
Well, how long have you been in LA? We, I, I don't know if you guys can tell, we have a, another real Italiano on the show today. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. so, buongiorno a tutti. Um, <gasps> a little bit Italian, yes. whatever you want, yes. I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, yeah, I've been in, in the United States for 11 years, uh, but in LA, I think at this point for six. Yeah. Okay. How do you, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on the pizza? <laughs> You know, I'm always on the hunt for some authentic Italian pizza, and I have a rec that I just tried. It's called Pizzeria Sei, mm. and it's tiny, so you have to make a reservation, but it's super legit. I loved it. Ooh, so I'm going to message you after. I'm a pizza snob. <laughs> We're both from the okay, East okay. Coast, and mm. um, so Jersey, New York, we love our pizza. So I come here and yeah. honestly, I've had the best pizza excursion here. So I can okay, give good. you my yeah. racks and you can tell me like- We, we need to do an exchange pizza exchange. list. Pizza yes. list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, it's not every day we get to meet a real Italian um, out here, filmmaker who speaks very well English, like in Thank your you. project that we're going to get to <sighs> today, you also act in it and your English, is so good like it's Dang. yeah there's no accent there's no accent yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> you can tell it all. good to know i did drill that accent so hard so i was like okay i hope i can play american so it's good to hear. definitely pulled it off yeah okay, good, good, good. and you told us how long you've been here what actually brought you over in the first place i, I would say the industry yeah mm -hmm. i first uh got to virginia because I had a scholarship for sailing. I used to be an athlete okay. and they had a theater program there. And so I was like, great, let me just get free school mm -hmm. and get into this industry in a way. Um, and then after that, I went to New York and then LA. So I was able to figure out like where I wanted to land in the industry. But yeah, I came here for acting and then I became more of a filmmaker later. I feel like that's how it starts for a lot of people. You know, you come for one thing, whether it's acting or writing or whatever, and then you end up realizing like, you kind of have to do it all. <laughs> you start learning Absolutely. more and more of it and you fall in yeah. love with other parts. So I tell all my actor friends, you gotta, if you have a story you want to tell, write it, find, you don't even have to direct it or, or film it yourself. There are a ton of filmmakers mm -hmm. out here in LA who want to collaborate mm -hmm. and need a yeah. script. So if you can even just start with writing something for yourself, that's the best way to go. So I'm curious, how did you go from just starting out as an actor to writing and producing mm -hmm. to then making your first web series, Imposter, which again, we're going to explore, but we want to know a little, we love to know how one becomes a multi-hyphenate because I th yeah. think it's important to share that we all don't just start out doing everything all at once. It's really hard. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I started as an actor and I always wrote, but I never really thought of it as something like that I seriously wanted to do. Um, <laughs> but then I, well, I needed to get a visa to stay here mm -hmm. and as an international artist, you have to prove you're extraordinary in your field. Mm -hmm. and that's, you know, the name is Aliens for Extraordinary Ability. So you have to show that you've done these great projects. And, you know, you start auditioning, you start hoping, and then you're like, oh, okay, like, I don't know if I'm going to get that lead role. I don't know if this project is going to get into festivals. And so I was like, what if I did that myself? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, great, then I'm going to write something that I can make with, you know, the, re the resources I have. So very little money. I had another friend of mine who's international be in it. So it would help her visa as well. And then That's we right. just kind of rallied the troops, you know, all the people we knew were like, how do I do this? Like, can you help yeah. out? And that was a short film called Polly Pocket. Um, and then that I took it to festivals and it did fairly well. We got some awards, some selections, and that got me my visa. I mean, I had other projects, but I would say that that was the cherry on the cake because it had a lot wow. of awards. Yeah. So that was really nice. And I met a producer. He was a programmer at one of these film festivals. And he was like, the next thing you do, let me know because I want to be in on it. And yeah, and uh, wow. 
Let's I know. Go. I know. I was like, okay, this friends have been working for me. That's good. <laughs> um, and then I was like, well, the pandemic hit. And I started to think about, well, what do I do? I do need to get a green card at some point. <laughs> and so I kind of use that as like something to motivate me to be ambitious and bold. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, what, where do I want to go with my career? And I really, I, I want to create a TV show. And so I was like, okay, how can I do that in a, in a way that's manageable and that I can show what I can do with little resources. And I was like, okay, this is bigger than a short film. So hopefully that will help for the green card. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, great, I'm going to make this thing and attach all the people that I know that are great. Obviously a high level production than my short. Um, And I did it. We crowdfunded a bunch of money to make it really nice. Um, And yeah, here we are. And I have a green card. So (laughs) I guess mission accomplished on that. Amazing. (laughs) Wait, that is crazy. (laughs) That is crazy, Veronica. I don't know. I've only, and I want to say that is crazy for all the listeners who are not have reached the level of success because that Mm -hmm. is huge. Like, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Second of all, what's some advice you could give to someone who is, is trying to get their green card or their, their visa, just because I'm sure there's listeners who are like, that sounds really easy, but it's, it's definitely not, more. it's, it's definitely yeah. way more than just winning some awards, but mm-hmm. how, and, and I don't want to speak for you, but that's, I know that there's probably more to it than that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if there's any, before we, I think this is an interesting topic. If there's any yeah. th- advice you could give to someone who's like, wait, that's, that's it. Or like, is there yeah. something else I could do to better position myself? Yeah. No, 100%. There's a lot to it. Um, there are certain requirements you have to fit to get the visa. And then the green card that I got is kind of the same. Uh, you know, it's a green card for extraordinary ability. So it's mm-hmm. harder to get than the O one visa, but it's not the same green card that you get when you get married, for example. So I still have to prove certain things. Yep. Um, you know, some of those things is getting press. Uh, then you have to have uh, a bunch of lead roles. You have to show that the productions were uh, relevant in some sort of way, wow. they were distinguished. And then awards, you know, they kind of prove your credibility. So they prove all these things that all the things you did are, are awesome and you're great. Um, so I would say don't panic because <laughs> if you read what you need to do, it sounds insane because they're like, Oh, uh, show us if you have any awards, like an Emmy award or an Oscar. Like, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, I, that's never going to be me, or at least not in the next year, you know, which is the yeah. time you have when you graduate. So I would say uh, don't panic. Uh, many of us have done it before, so it's doable. I would say get very strategic about um, putting your time and effort in projects that have a high probability of getting you to hit those requirements. Um, And oftentimes those are smaller projects rather than big TV shows. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start out, you may get a co-star on a TV show and that's amazing. That doesn't really look that good on an application for a visa because it's it's considered a small role. While if you are a lead role in a short film that goes to festivals, that's big. So I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, you know, I think a lot of people do think, co-starring on this hit Netflix show yeah. is going to be a better leverage because Netflix has a reputation, yeah. but it's really leading a leading role. Yes. Even in absolutely. a small, I think that's actually a really, it, I, I've never heard that before. So yeah. I, I learned mm-hmm. something today. That's really, yeah. and that's incredible that you were able to position yourself strategically in these ways Mm -hmm. and I love that it was a motivation for you I think we all need those those motivators and that's I mean congrats that's it's it is really hard to do so Mm -hmm. that's super impressive thank you it was definitely a great feeling of like okay I conquered this massive thing that was kind of my main goal of my whole adult life and now it's (laughs) like okay I can do I can do hard things you know so it's yeah it's nice to set those goals and be like I did that what's what's the next thing, you know? That's the beauty of it. I mean, like for Carolina and I, our first project, it was just like a very short, like proof of concept for a larger thing that we had in mind. 
But even mm-hmm. with that, like we didn't really know what we were doing going into it. And we, it was a Western. So it was very involved. And for us, like wow. the naivete of not knowing like how involved it was going to be kept us from being afraid to do it, you know? So we just jumped right in. And for you, it yeah. was like, Hey, I've got this big goal that I have to reach in this short amount of time. So let's just do the thing, you know? And I think yeah. that's great because when you really just jump into that first project like that and give it your all, and it's something bigger than maybe you would have thought to take on had you known all the details, oh then God, you're yeah. already at that yeah. level, you know, you're just starting out and you already know what you're doing. So for the next thing, it's going to be even better and even more professional. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it easier to be a beginner at the next mm-hmm. thing. Cause you're like, I was an absolute beginner and I did all this. Now I already know a little bit more. So even though, you know, it's a, it's a new mountain, it's like, okay, I've been here before and I've conquered it. So I I can do the next thing. Absolutely. Exactly. I love that. It's a, it's a, it's confidence building because really what both of you are saying is I think a lot of uh, times creators will just stop themselves from going big because Mm -hmm. we all have insecurities. We are all are just don't have that trust built in ourselves yet to be like, yeah, I can take this on and lead this team, but you have to start testing yourself at some point. And if you just stay in a safe space, then you won't get into like, let's say the bigger festivals, you won't get yourself, you won't be able to get yourself out there Mm -hmm. and, and really start to climb those mountains and build that confidence. So I think it's, it's a great reminder that, or a showcase rather of how, if you do just kind of, sometimes it's do or die. And if that was in your case, you're like, I have to do this. Otherwise, like yeah. I'm stuck without, I'm, I don't get to be here. Mm-hmm. And I think for everyone else who's listening, well, how often do you feel like stuck in your own, whether it's your full time or a, a position in the industry that you're not happy with? At some point, you do need to just take yourself out of the comfort zone and just go for it, even if you don't have all the answers. Because if you're, if you like you said, if you're able to pass that marker, then you know you can handle anything. And that's definitely mm-hmm. how I feel. I'm, I'm like, I don't care how crazy my ideas are. I, I just know, like, I'm always able to execute and pull them off. And they're not always perfect the first time around, but I know I get them to a place where I feel like I can, I can lead the next thing. I got this. Yeah. So it's a really great place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, And And I I feel like action is always better than trying to be perfect. You know, Mm -hmm. I think the filmmakers who are most interesting and exciting are not the filmmakers who make the perfect film. They're the filmmakers who make films. Yeah. You know, so you're like, okay, you keep making stuff. Like you (laughs) keep putting yourself out there. You keep experimenting. You're being artistic. And I have to remind myself of that a lot because I'm, uh, perfectionist um, unfortunately and it's like you got to make stuff even if you're not 100 percent sure how you're not 100 percent sure how good it's going to be you never are going to know really until the end even then you're you know you have a bias um so it's like just make things even if it's small whatever it is because that's more exciting it's going to bring you more opportunities than just being perfectionist and not making stuff you know Exactly. Like- and you need those things to get you to a point of anywhere. You know, I mean, I think people mm-hmm. who aren't in the industry, you know, they'll see someone like it's their first film, quote unquote, but it's just the first film that made it big. It's the first film that, you know, Absolutely. got picked up on Netflix or whatever it is. And they, yeah. I'm sure, have years and years of experience and years and years of short films or other features or whatever before that, you know, yeah. and you need those things to get anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you did the short, you said you found Mm -hmm. a producer, was the web series then the next project that you wanted to pursue? Yeah, yeah, it was. I I really just had this vision of creating a TV show. And that's why I was like, I just want to make an entire web series where I control the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, And I'm going to show what I can do. And then hopefully, you know, my career will, will benefit from it. Mm-hmm. Um, versus in making a pilot and then hoping that someone buys it, right? That to me doesn't feel like a completed artistic project. It feels like, like a proof of concept, which mm-hmm. is yeah. absolutely fine. And in a way, my web series is a proof of concept because I'm proving that I can 
create a, a concept in, in its entirety, but it was exciting to me to be like, okay, let's, let's make this whole thing. Um, and yeah, I started writing it and the pandemic hit and I was like, let's just write the whole thing. And <laughs> I think I posted on my Instagram and this producer came to me back and was like, what are you writing? And I was like, yeah, let's see. Like, to me. <laughs> Uh, and then it's like, okay, let's do it. Um, and yeah, I think then the next step was figuring out whether I wanted to direct it as well. Mm -hmm. At some point I was like, I want to direct it because I want to, I have a very clear vision. Um, but I, I, I kind of paused and I was like, okay, I've never acted, written and directed something. So let me test it out. So I shot, I think like two very tiny short films scenes to see like, how is this experience gonna go? Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is hard, okay. Um, <laughs> let's not do it for this web series. That felt huge to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I do wanna do that, but I was like, this feels too high stakes. And they, as, as you guys know, like when you're acting or writing director, you're like, your brain is everywhere. And I felt like I wanted to have the chance to do my best job as an actress. And I was like, I feel like on set, I need to just be acting. So let's get a director on who will be able to, you know, helm the team uh, while I'm acting and also add to it. Like, how can someone else elevate my vision? And I, I feel like Shada, our director, really did that. Yeah, that's amazing. The, there's two things I want to highlight in what you just said, like, First of all, I love that you decided to do it as a web series instead of, like you said, just shooting the pilot to try to sell mm -hmm. it. Because, you know, whether your ultimate goal is to sell it or to just get out specifically what, you know, you actually shot and produced, I mm -hmm. think that's a really, um, how can I say this? Like, it's a really great um, thing for the project because it then provides you with a finished product that shows off everything you can do. Like it is in its entirety, a finished project, a finished web series season, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to, Hey, I've got this really great pilot, but like, that's all I can really prove for myself. Like the rest is going to be on whatever, you know, company picks it up to see how they, if they can produce it and what they want to turn it into and all of this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, it does that double duty because it is also, I think a really great selling tool as well. You know, they can see, mm -hmm. Hey, she's able to write this whole, you know, season rounded story. She's able to produce it, you know, and maybe that affects, you know, depending on what the production company is, how much they want to actually put into it or how much input they want to have with it. Mm -hmm. um, and like Caroline and I had said, we were talking about it after we watched it. We were like, we could absolutely see this being like a full TV series, you know, mm -hmm. on Netflix or Hulu or whatever, like it, it is totally sellable. So I think it's really cool that you chose that route instead of just like having a script or having just the pilot, you know? And the other thing I wanted to say is um, I think that's really great that you tried it out as an actor, director, and writer before you made that decision. Because I think that's a really tough decision for a lot of people. You know, either they really want to have full control of it and they really want to do it and they either succeed or they realize, whoa, this is too overwhelming, you know? Um, and being able to make that decision for yourself, I think is really important because some people are able to absolutely do it and absolutely pull it off. And some people are not, you know, and the fact that you actually tried that out first and realized like what was meant for you, I think is really smart. Yeah, I had the vision of like, I mean, I've seen it happen. I feel like you guys have seen it too. When you see a project and you're like, oh, this person is a writer, director, producer, and everything. And it's a great project, but they were the weakest link on camera and I was like I don't want that to be me so yeah. like let me let me see if I can actually handle that and do my best work and when I was doing those little shorts I was like I it's not like I'm doing a terrible job but I'm like I know I could have done further if I didn't have half a brain thinking about whatever the shot whatever you know mm -hmm. so it, it was a really very good for me to see it also that way I don't feel any regrets you know I'm not mm -hmm. like Oh, what if I had directed it? I would have made this different choice. It's like, no, I knew I needed someone else. And so even when, I don't know, something that I saw later in the footage looked a little bit different than what I thought in my head, I, I wasn't bitter about it. I'm like, oh, okay, that was, you know, the director's vision in that moment and it works and great, you know? Yeah. No, I, I think um, even you said too that 
I think it's also important to, as, as someone who writes, directs, acts, and all the thing produces, mm -hmm. it's, it's important to know which project you want to go for it as well. And like you said, maybe that's mm -hmm. just something you approach at a, another, another project and maybe mm -hmm. you get to do a little bit more of that. Um, cause I had the same battle with our feature with decide, coming up with that decision of like, am I going to direct this? Cause I so see the vision and mm -hmm. I'm glad I did, but it's, it yeah. was, it, it was probably one of the hardest Difficult. things for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and something that I would totally do again, but also I don't know if I would want to do that from my projects or. And it's something, you know, again, I just am going to feel out with the stories I write, like what mm -hmm. feels good for me to do that, having experienced that. But again, like what we were talking about earlier, I just like to go for it. And, and then even if it's scary and crazy, I'm like, I'm going to go for it. I'll see what I, yeah, and I out. just, just build that trust with myself. So I'm like, okay, I trust yeah. myself. I, I was able to do it. I have some notes and, you know, I think I've, I've maybe I, I'd love to like pass on other roles if I can in, in some way. So it's not yeah. just a lot of pressure. Um, no, I, get, I, I think... get the brain thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And you know what? I forgot to mention because I, I'm talking about it as if, you know, the, the audience has seen it, but the, my character has a lot of talking to camera. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this is already going to be an acting challenge of really having to address the camera a lot and making that a character that mm. I was like, uh, this is, I, I think I, I really need someone very on it on the other side of the camera to make sure it's reading when I am turning to camera in between sentences even. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think I do want to do that. Just like you said, I want to go for it. Uh, and I, I just think this project because of the role, I was like, mm, I think I'm going to fuck it up. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> next time when I'm not talking to the damn camera, yeah. I think I, I'll go for it. Because then it's like, I can be my own world and maybe have, I, I've talked to people who've done it successfully. I mean, like, oh, I had a very trusted DP. And they kind of gave me even some little acting notes. And I'm like, okay, I can see how that works. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm excited yeah. for that challenge. And I'll, I'll be asking you, Carolina, for some, oh, for some advice. Call me up, girl. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something that I honestly, I was through this podcast, I was trying to find more people who did it. And I yeah. met a lot of actor producers, but it was a hard, I, I actually don't, I think maybe one of our guests did all of them, mm -hmm. but it was hard. And I was like, can someone tell me that this is possible? Cause I've seen <laughs> it on the, I've seen it on Netflix. Like it, people do it. But yeah. of course that was even more intimidating. I'm like, well, they've been on thousand sets so they're yeah. better than me <laughs> no but it's like we got this we got this yeah. no and you totally got it and i love that you saw the technical also aspect of it just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it, it all makes sense and i actually want to talk about the story a little bit if you mm -hmm. since our audience haven't seen it yeah. what what is imposter about and why mm -hmm. did you want to pursue the themes um because i thought they were very interesting and specific mm -hmm. yeah so Imposter is about a young female painter that I portray. Um, she's desperate to get noticed. So she steals this outrageous idea from her ex-boyfriend and turns it into a feminist performance art piece that goes viral. So now everyone wants a piece of her and she's conflicted between showing her authentic uh, artistic expression and what she feels like everyone wants from her, which she is like, this is not me. So yeah, feelings uh, explores the the themes of feminism and art, mm -hmm. um, uh, feelings of imposter syndrome, the line between taking inspiration and stealing. Uh, yeah, so there's there's quite a bit of layers there. Yeah, I yeah. love too that you did use um, the whole like talking to camera thing because it felt like it just fit so well for like what's going on in, in this character's head of like, I'm constantly lying and I'm constantly faking it and like <laughs> having those asides to the camera. I thought was really fun for that. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that read because I was like, I want the audience to be in on it and be like, oh, we really know her. Mm -hmm. And then without spoiling too much, there is a bit of a, a flip and I, I don't know. I really love to do that as a writer, mm -hmm. like 
setting it up in a way that like I'm I'm leading the audience by the hand, like this is what this is. I know what assumptions you're gonna make and this is what it is, and then flipping it on its head in the hopes that that makes the audience the audience change their mind on something. Yeah. I love what you say to um, kind of your like inspiration. I'm going to read the quote that you provided. Um, the way that women are portrayed in the media reflects and shapes our ideas of women in real life. We think that stories about unapologetic, flawed, defiant, and even, gasp, unlikable female characters can inspire women to take space and to live their lives in all their imperfect glory. I love that too, because yeah, like women are not, I feel like having quote unquote, unlikable characters, like flawed characters, it's sometimes really difficult, you know, because you want to mm -hmm. like portray them as a whole person, but you want, you know, you want it to be real, but you still want the audience to like them and to understand where they're coming from. And yeah, especially for women, it's, it's an extra challenge. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, well, I think when I was writing it, um, there was a lot of like, you know, these female icons like these celebrities that everyone was obsessed with and then suddenly everyone was piling on to them and was like gosh mm -hmm. we are canceling them we hate them because they said something kind of random or they found out something from their past and i'm not talking about the real like really bad stuff that some people did and we canceled them that's fine it was kind of something small or something like i just i just don't like her i just mm -hmm. you know i just i'm not sure about her and I was just witnessing that. And I was like, what is going on? Like these women are, you know, put on a pedestal and we're all obsessed with them. And then slowly but surely they're, you know, they're falling off the cliff and we're all like, no, we're done with them. Um, and so I was just interested in, in how they might be feeling of like, am I an icon or am I an imposter? And where does that leave me the real person um the real artist who's because a lot of these people are actors writers right directors uh models whatever it is they are honestly just practicing their art and they're getting fame because of it and i was interested to explore that and then on a personal note i was experiencing a lot of imposter syndrome and i you know i started to explore how, why am I feeling like this? I don't think it's because I'm insecure because in a lot of ways I'm really not, but there's things from the outside, from society, from my family, from friends, from everything that is contributing to that feeling of not being enough and not belonging that I kind of feel like it's uniquely female or uniquely of, you know, minorities. Um, and I'm really happy to hear that a lot of men also uh, understood the piece and uh, identified with her because I do feel like that feeling is universal but I, I really was interested in studying how does that affect women in a very with a very unique brand if that makes mm -hmm. sense yeah I I kind of um the way I saw it symbolically for myself as someone who identifies as a woman and and the way I feel like I've had to kind of think about art and the way I even portray myself um, on social media, it's this mm -hmm. like, I want to show and express my words, my film, the you know, our show, our stories. I, I, Tessa and I have had conversations, I'm sure, especially in the beginning when we were like building up our brand. And I right away was like, Tessa, I don't want to just like, show hot girl photos because that's <laughs> what is going to validate what people what I feel at, at least when we first started was getting like a lot of tension yeah and the thing is like for me personally though on my own I don't want to call myself a brand everyone uses that word but for me personally especially when I was younger I enjoyed taking photos like as a woman that like, made me feel good and so it was like that fine line of okay I like this for me and then when I want to combine my art with it, how much is that for me or because it's going to be seen as like some sort of validation? And mm -hmm. I thought I saw that in the work that your main character does. She does a piece that was very personal to her that wasn't exhibitioning her body in a way with the art. 
but yet that was retrieving more traction whenever she was unclothed and bearing her soul still but it's like feels a little bit manipulated by what the media and her audience was validating for her and and I feel like I just so resonated with that of like okay hey, what is going to help sell my sell is the wrong word but I think a lot of women can relate to that pressure of hmm, hmm. this feels a little sexy and I'm gonna like this is what helps sell, but it's inauthentic. Mm. And then when you do try to voice yourself, you're like, well, no one likes it, but that's not true. Like, mm. you know, there is work that is respected and people like, and you don't have to sell yourself for it. So yeah. I just went on that tangent, but that's how I saw it symbolically with paralleling through the, like the female lens and, and mm -hmm. how we like what, what you didn't see on social media you know, in yeah. terms of that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I, I love that take. And I'm, I'm always very curious to see how people interpret it because there's, I think a bit of different angles, like people can latch on to. And it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a constant struggle of like, do I cater to what I think people want and what I think the market needs or whatever, right? Or do I just do whatever the heck I'm feeling right now? Um, and you know what, sometimes that might mean being more revealing, that might mean being more sexy, but then that could help you, but that could also hinder you because then you can also be called all sorts of things. Right. So it's like that, ah, oh, frick, like I can't, I can't win, you know? And that's exactly what you were saying about celebrities. It's like people love to build people up and then they just want to tear them down and then mm -hmm. they'll have a renaissance. <laughs> And they'll yeah. turn them down oh again. God, mm -hmm. The renaissances yeah. are happening right now. Yeah. Um, and it's just really funny because I was like, I don't know why you guys hated this person to begin with. Like, I have yeah. no idea. And mm -hmm. you just, like, wanted to tear them apart. And that's just a whole problem with society as a whole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think that, yeah, as, as an artist and especially as a woman starting out in this industry, I got advice from men to, like, yeah, it's great, especially because my co-producer is a woman too. Like, you girls just kind of make it a little sexy. And I just I was like, mm, mm. that feels wrong, sir. Don't <laughs> like, like, I, I hear just saying these are advice they gave you. What the yeah, heck? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay, bold. And like in a, in that subtle way, though, like yeah. the way that your character gets spoken to even in the film, uh -huh. which is, yeah. again, what I truly as, as a young actor starting out in Hollywood not having the community that I have today. And I, I always tell, like, I was just on a film panel. I think I'm very passionate about finding your community and finding the right people yeah. to guide you. It's not the executive who's been on a board for like 20 years. That's mm -hmm. not your, it's not your guy. It's not your girl. You got to yeah. find your people because I was already getting the wrong kind of advice. And again, like I just, I, really related to your main character as someone mm -hmm. who was first starting in the industry and getting like, okay, like, yeah, I'm hot. Like I, I can, you know, get attention. It's much quicker, but that's not the attention I want. I want to be taken seriously. Yeah. And, and that's like, you know, something you like learn to navigate and you're like, okay, I got to be true to myself and that's staying true to yourself. Right. And building yeah. the kind of body of work that again, I like to be a little sexual. That's fine. But it's on my terms and how I want it to yes. be painted through like the female gaze, as we like yeah. to say with our company. So no, I loved the way you, I was blown away with the writing. I thought mm -hmm. it was spot on to how like I first felt when it came to Hollywood. I can yeah. see you're emotional. Like, what do you feel? <laughs> how do you feel? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. It's, um, you know, while you do a project for, for a few years, some point you're like does this even make sense or like do people even care like you know what i mean yeah. it's like this yeah. isn't good like what is this totally. you know um so it's really and i'm at a point where i'm like i've seen it too many times i know it too well and oh, girl i feel you right now with yeah. our film. <laughs> like yeah so many times now i'm like i'm i'm not even surprised i don't get the chills that you first no. used to get right exactly it, yeah. the spark that first got you super excited is like yeah. kind of buried um but i get the spark back when i talk to people like you like you guys who are like 
I, I felt seen and I understand that and that made me feel validated. Um, that's kind of all we want as artists, you know, make something that makes people feel something at the end of the day, whether you're feeling validated or someone else is like, I feel fired up because of it. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to create some sort of emotional response that in my case, for my type of art, I, I like a bit of an intellectual discourse underneath. Like, yes, laugh and it's fun, but something underneath that's like, hmm, maybe I didn't think this through. Maybe I need to change my mind on this. Yeah. And I mean, I think this goes for both like the real life and the meat or the um, intention behind imposter is like you you never know what pe how people are going to react. You can't control how people react and how they take it. Right. So if you're creating mm -hmm. something that is really coming from how you feel and something that's genuine to you, somebody's going to relate to it because they're going to feel that genuineness mm -hmm. and you're never alone in how you feel about something. You know, there's always other people yeah. out there that, are, that it's going to resonate with. Yeah, I agree. It's it's kind of a lie that you have to kind of be universal mm -hmm. and try to appeal to a bunch of people. I, I think the things that I like the most are the stories that are the most specific and niche, even though yeah. they have nothing to do with me. And, you know, they're about something that I have an idea about before watching it. Um, but I relate to the humanness and the details really just make it vivid. So mm -hmm. I, I always try to be like, what's what's my specific experience that I can translate into my art versus like, what's commercial? What do people want now? Right. You know, mm -hmm. oh, that gets I, I was just thinking about like, that's <clears throat> how I feel with our film. I, I I threw some weird specific things in there and I, I really like I'm hoping that it, it resonates and reads well. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to be on on your end we're, we're getting Yay. very close on the festival and oh, just seeing so you get excited. that feedback yeah. yeah well i want to get a little bit into the logistics because i'm mm -hmm. a producer hat right yes. so we've got six eight minute episodes that comes mm -hmm. about to a total of 50 minutes which is like mm -hmm. feature length sh <laughs> shit here <Yeah. laughs> and like amazing so understanding that i'm very curious how you went about shooting it. I, I would love to know if you did this consecutively um, mm -hmm. and just made it like how we did. We shot our feature in 11 days, for instance. I'm, okay. I'm just curious, like, wow, that's you know, ambitious. <laughs> Thank you. Ambitious, yes. ambitious yeah. Yeah. is our name. Um, <laughs> name of the game, uh, Fabregard. So <laughs> I just laugh because everything, I'm like, so this is very ambitious, but this is what the timeline is and this is what yeah, we're doing. What, we got to make it happen. What we do. Yeah. We got to <laughs> make it happen. Absolutely. So I just laugh. Yeah. It's like our yeah. word, ambitious. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I would like to know, never having broken, done a web series episodic before, and I just mm -hmm. love that. I was surprised to see it was eight minutes because I was like, wait, that's really smart. So talk to me about mm -hmm. how you structured that, came up with that idea and how you found yeah. it. Uh, well, okay. Truth be told, I, uh, okay, I'm like a forever student. I freaking love a class. Like, get me in school and leave me there. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy. And so <laughs> whenever I'm like, what new thing do I want to do? I get myself into a class. Um, I just have a bit of that um, best student syndrome where I'm like raising my hand every chance I get, first row. <laughs> and I use that to my benefit. So, mm -hmm. I'm like, I know if I get into a class, I will try to be the best student for the teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I will get some stuff done. So when I finished the whole thing with my short film, I was like, okay, what's next? I think I want to do a TV show, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know where to start. I got myself into a web series class mm -hmm. at Second City. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Not unexpected, didn't I? Know. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. it was a great class. I did it with a friend. She was also like, I don't know what to do next. I was like, let's do it. Like our schedules are aligning somehow. This is a sign. Let's go. <laughs> that never and happens so, in LA, by the way, for anyone that's listening, that's not. <laughs> literally not. Yeah. No, it's a sign. You're like, this is a sign. Yeah, doing exactly. It. <laughs> and it's like, oh, we get to hang out once a week consistently. We're just going even just to hang out, me and you. Um, and so we went to this class and it, it was really cool because it, first of all, it helps you just get an idea that felt viable for a web series 
Um, I kind of understood the nitty gritty of what web series are. Um, and then I think by the end of the class, I had an idea of the arc of the series and I had a first draft of the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, and in that class, I learned that, you know, the things that do best online are in between eight and 12 minutes, you know, that 10 minute mark. And I knew from festivals that that's also great time, uh, timestamp for uh, festivals. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that sounds doable. That makes sense to me. Um, and then uh, I don't know how I came up with the sixth episode. I think I, I honestly started from the end. I was like, I know what I want the end to be of the series. Um, how do I work backwards? And so mm -hmm. when you watch the series, you kind of do start from the end, like something big or has happened. And then yeah. there's sprinkled in these clues to kind of have, make you have an idea of what really happened that day. And so I just kind of worked backwards. I'm like, where do I have to put these clues in? And then what are these situations I want to put her in to kind of raise the stakes and show this dynamic she's going through psychologically? So, you know, she meets a family in one episode, she meets friends and then lover, all these people. Um, and so, yeah. You did a great job of blending those storylines, by the mm -hmm. way. That's, that's hard to weave in. But like you said, by focusing each episode on a specific person, event, yeah. like you built that arc. And while yeah. still you've like fil filtered in another relationship. So we're like, oh, wh who's that person? Like what, what it like the ex kept coming through. And I, yeah. I like that. Then finally you let us meet him later mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, I felt like a puzzle, which is also fun, you know, as a writer to be like, okay, where do I piece the things? How so do I... fun. Yes. <laughs> Instead of, <laughs> it's hard. And you're like, I you're like, do this to myself. okay. Yeah. It's going great. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You're like, this doesn't fit. But then at some point it fits, you just rewrite, rewrite it. Um, <laughs> and you know what? That's kind of how we shot it, where we shot consecutively. We shot, I want to say nine days and we had to do a pickup shoot. Um, but because the episodes were about eight to 10 minutes each, um, and every episode was in a new location with new characters, it kind of ended up being every day was a new location, um, and new actors, maybe a few people were like two days, something like that. So it worked out in that way of like, okay, this makes sense to do all together. Mm -hmm. instead of waiting especially because the whole story happens in one day you know there's flashbacks but then right. the present day is a day so you don't want to you know it's scary to wait months and years. you just never know what happens to your hair and the wardrobe right. and, and whatever you know so that felt like the thing that made the most sense yeah and when Love you it. were writing it were you writing it with that in mind as well like this will make it easier to film it this way? Or did it just kind of, you figured that out after you had already written everything? Yeah, you know, I don't remember which writing teacher told me this, but it's the best advice I've ever got. He was like, you know, everyone wants to uh, think outside the box, you know? And he was like, you guys should write inside the box. Mm. Create your own box. And mm -hmm. by that he meant set some parameters, you know? And I learned with my short film before that, and even in school, like this is the budget, which is sometimes zero or like very low, that's your box. So right. you, that's what you have. And so you have to figure out what, how can I make this happen? Yeah. And so I, I always th thought we're going to make this. So I'm not going to put a car chase in there. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to put things that I know we can make happen. Uh, that's how I write. And I, I think that's, something that now that I'm writing bigger things, I'm like, oh, I maybe have to let that go a little bit. I can be a little more ambitious. Yeah. Uh, but it's helpful so that you don't feel like, oh my God, I can write about anything. No, it's like, okay, let's, how about I choose these locations because I know I can attain them, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's I think that's advice. really smart. Like, you know, to write with everything in mind of what you're able to do, what you know you're able to pull off. And then you, cause you can always write like a, 
an extra scene that you're like, okay, we it'll still be a complete project without this scene. But like, if we end up having enough money or we can end up booking this actor or whatever, then this is like a dream scene that I want to add, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think it's, uh, you can always, I mean, you can always get very creative. You can always add a dolly or whatever. You can always make things look really cool. Mm -hmm. But if you start right off the bat with something that is very expensive, um, if you start with something that's very expensive, it's you're kind of just shooting yourself in the foot if you are an independent filmmaker just starting from zero in a way, you know? Right. Uh, and yeah. so we crowdfunded a bunch of money, but still we could have used more. So always, I'm, I'm always. Right yeah. in, in a crazy way. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, but, go ahead. No, I, I just was going to say, I, 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 that is the advice I give for anyone who's mm -hmm. doing like a low budget project, especially your first one, like minimal locations, right? One to two main characters, like yeah. the main, main ones. And then, and then see where, how it fits from there. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I, you know, like you said, like, I kind of love, I love a restriction. It's kind of fun <laughs> to force yourself to make things work and there's so much creativity that comes out of it yes. so i do mm -hmm. think it's a positive thing even though we could feel like well it sucks i can't dream this thing up but then you you will get there one day like you said now you're yeah. like actually allowing yourself to kind of dream a little bit bigger and that's mm -hmm. amazing that like that's amazing but you built the skills to know how to produce something on a low budget which is a very high value skill that people look for when trying to work with a producer director, because the last thing people want to do, even though if the budget's bigger, is still work with someone who wants like to film on another planet. It's like, mm -hmm. we, we don't even have that technology yet. We can't yeah. go to space. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, you know, I think it, it actually speaks really highly of you as a director, even if it's your first film, if you're able to show off, like you said, a concept that was done on a low budget and you made it look like it was done with way more, which mm -hmm. the film, the, the, the episodic definitely looks high, high quality, which is mm -hmm. what our goal was too. Is like, we really hope people see our yeah. film and can't guess the budget. Like nice. they're not yeah. sure, you know, it's yeah. Like, what, what do these girls do? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, Tessa, you were going to say something though. That, that, that's all I need. <laughs> that. Give me a mic and I'm going to talk on it. But that's all. No, I just wanted to get into you a little more. Um, since we're talking about budget, you had mentioned that you crowdfunded. And I believe the crowdfunding was your only funding, right? Going into it pretty much. Like that, you guys uh, yeah. hit a lot. And that's impressive. Like, I, I want to hear more yeah. about that process, how that worked for you. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, this is probably the hardest thing about this whole this whole thing um yeah and it was a huge amount of work really huge not gonna lie um yeah we we raised more than 100 percent of our goal which was fifty five thousand dollars. um it took us i would say three months of prep work and then one month of campaign mm -hmm. so you know that's yeah. basically half a year um yeah. and it's it's doable yes but I guess I want to say that because I, I hear a lot of people that come to me for advice and they're like, oh, I want to do this and I want to shoot it in two months. I'm like, okay. I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, yeah. you can do it. But when you don't have money, I mean, what is the saying? Like there's money, quality and time. Like you can only have two. So if you don't have the money and you want quality, you need to put in the time. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of the, the trade off there. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of had, we recruited a team of like, I think we're 21 people, 23 people to work on the crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I rallied all of my international friends. So we had people from literally everywhere in the world, uh, working remote. I love that. It was really cool. We had, the campaign was trilingual because we, mm -hmm. we had everything written in English and Italian and Spanish because we had a lot of Latin American folks working on the team. Um, and it was just a big push on social media. Facebook was huge, which I thought was dead, but it ain't. <laughs> and then a lot of emails, um, a lot of newsletters. So a lot of like, you know, like a template email, but then also personalized emails. 
And I guess the, you know, to, to sum it up, we had 20 million people reaching out to their communities. And so it kind of becomes a numbers game of like, how many people can I have on the team? How can we all align and have a plan and execute it? And at some point, just by the numbers of it, you will reach to a certain amount of people and a certain percentage will help you out if the campaign is built professionally. And that's where I came in with my little perfectionist hat. Where I was like, graphic is not perfect. But it really, that. yeah, but it, it was <laughs> yeah. like, okay, I want to yeah. show, we don't have anything except for right. the website. This. Exactly. Right. So I'm like, I want it to look mm-hmm. bomb. You know, I want people to be mm-hmm. like, oh, this is going to look amazing. Yeah. So that's where I put also in the writing of the campaign, I, I put the voice of uh, the, the tone of our series. And so I, that I think people were like, were telling us, I've never seen a campaign built this way. And they were excited to help. So I think that was the strategy we adopted. Yeah, I that's like right. such such a key thing with uh, crowdfunding is like really strategizing how to make your campaign stand out. You know, I mm-hmm. love like you said, like you wrote it like in the the voice of the show and like whatever it is that's going to stand out to people is going to be a huge thing because especially being in this industry, like we get people crowdfunding all the time, people hitting us up like, Hey, you know, support if you can share if you can't. And it's like, you know, we want to share for our friends and our community, but we can't share everything, unfortunately. And we can't donate to everything, unfortunately, you know, but the things that really stand out and really excite us, we do, you know, and even, you know, you're going to have a lot of friends and family and people that are already fans and audience supporting, but there are going to be people that don't know you and they're just stumbling yeah. upon these things and again if yeah. you can excite them they're going to want to support it yeah no 100 percent. it's i kind of approach it as like this is my piece of art right now mm-hmm. you know the the emails i'm crafting the the campaign page the pitch video this is the art so i'm gonna put all my creative juice into it as if i'm showing the film and I think where a lot of filmmakers fail in that is that they want to do it quickly. And mm-hmm. so they're like, I, I don't want to have, I don't want to put the time in, which is I, no shame. Right. Cause I get it. Like you want to get going and I think momentum is important. You don't want to stall on things for too long, but I think if you can use the talent you have, the skills that you have to make this campaign, the best it can be, it'll show. And people will see that as credibility that you will create a great project. 100% agree. Yeah. Me and Carolina did that as Mm -hmm. well for our crowdfunding. Like we took, Mm -hmm. what was it? A full month, Carolina, I think to prep for the month long campaign. At least one. Yeah. It was like one to two months of of prep. And um, there, well, there was a, there's a couple of things I I tell uh, people who are looking for the advice. And that is, Mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, time like prep don't rush the prep period give yourself at least one to two months you did three so that's it's telling Mm -hmm. right and then another thing you mentioned which I say to have a team Tessa and I and maybe we brought someone else well we hired on a team for the first for the first round so we we did we had a team of people helping guide set templating all of that prep um and then like you said then have multiple ways of outreach and that's why you need a team because it's just too hard to put on yourself mm-hmm. and again like a lot of filmmakers are excited they want to rush and they think I don't think they see like they that the, the the way the team is incorporated into the campaign so they just do it themselves and then they're overwhelmed yeah. and then it's it's really hard it's just hard to do on your own so yeah that's why you know you need to start collaborating with your producer, your DP, even whoever is helping you, because you're you're not going to make the film yourself. So don't start when you're about to have the money already and film to like rely on team members to help you. Yeah. Right, bring them in early on because they're going to be part of the marketing and the social media outreach and all of that. So I mm-hmm. think yeah, it's it's those three things. There's a, a few more, but that's a whole webinar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> truly. So yeah. I. I wanted to ask, um, which campaign platform did you use? We use Seed and Spark. What about you guys? 
We did Kickstarter and then Indiegogo. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So you guys split it in two? Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, first fundraised to like for actual production and then mm-hmm. we did it again for post-production. So the first one was okay. really important to us. Like we absolutely needed that money. We could not get started without it. We had to reach our goal and we actually surpassed yeah. our goal a little bit too, which was amazing. Nice. And then the amazing. post-production one was, you know, hey, we can't afford this all out of our own pocket, but it's not, you know, we don't have these dates set that we have to make sure that we have the full funding by. So it was a little yeah. like lower stakes for us, but gotcha. yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. I mean, like, again, it's impressive that you raised your entire budget, which is similar to ours all at mm-hmm. once, but we had to split it up because it was very hard to get all of it at once. Um, yeah. So yeah, the remainder, totally. it was so exciting that we were like, okay, we can film it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. But there is this momentum that happens. So what we didn't stop and say, oh, we don't have enough money now to edit it. Well, now that we then proved that we could film it and we did, then we use that as marketing material exactly. for the post-production, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think people too, like if you're listening and you haven't fundraised before, don't get discouraged if you don't raise it all at once. A lot of people need to raise it a few times and yeah. hopefully you can raise just enough to at least get the project felt shot if, if hopefully fully done, if not like a good chunk. So you can continue to show where the money's going to. You're showing like, I I'm doing this. I have the yeah. project. This look how amazing it looks. Cause we're yeah. fabulous. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's really, it's really great to, um, yeah, not to keep, there's ways to keep that momentum going. And mm-hmm. that's like, one of those decisions that I think was stressful for us, but we were like, no, this makes sense. We can do it. And we will, yeah. the money will come guys. Yeah. The money will come because we yeah. are abundant. Um, <laughs> but um, can you tell I was in musical theater? Uh, <laughs> yes. One other thing I want to say too about crowdfunding is like, it's also a great just audience building and marketing tool for you too. Like regardless of the actual literal money that you raise, because like, Mm -hmm. I know for us, you know, a lot of people were like, Hey, I just, I'm not financially able to contribute right right now, but I'll share it. And then they also want to keep up with it and they're asking about it, you know, or people that are like, Oh, right now I can't, but like in a couple months, could I like send you a donation, even though the campaign's over and, you know, we found ways to do that for people. Like it just really, it's an attention grabber for people, which Again, it's like, hey, any way that you can spread the word and build that audience, even if they're not actually literally donating to you at the time, is a bonus. Yeah. Yeah, we always said that. We were like, if you can't donate, even a share is amazing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it really translated because at some point I had people being like, I keep seeing your campaign everywhere. Yeah, And it's because we really encourage people to share, share, share. And that also creates that feeling of excitement and encouragement to donate. It's like, Okay, right. everyone's loving this. Everyone's in it. I want to be a part of it. So it, it, it is really helpful for the marketing side as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you are sweeping the film festival circuit with 28 plus nomination mm-hmm. and 14 plus awards. Something like that. Something, something like that. We're losing mm-hmm. count at this point. We, okay. we don't know. It's, there's an abundance there. Um, as we're heading into the film festival circuit ourselves, um, what is your, I'd love to hear a little bit of, you know, the distribution strategy. I, I think it's so what we found and love to hear your thoughts is, you know, festivals is a great way to bring press and validate the success of your project by having other, uh, you know, judges look at your work and then you receive awards. So is that what you felt was the best approach? Start there. And yeah, what would love to kind of hear your experience around that and deciding how to go about that? Yeah, no, for sure. I think, uh, you know, you guys have a feature film, so that's very clear cut. Like, okay, I'm trying to sell it. Like that's kind of the ultimate goal with a web series it is more of a stepping stone and yes, we can sell it. That's something we're trying to do. Um, but it's not, you know, a kind of a linear one plus one equals two situation. Mm-hmm. And we really wanted to showcase our talents uh, of the team. 
And at the end of the day, someone giving you an award is someone saying, this is awesome. So we really went hard with the festivals because we were like, we just want that stamp of approval um, just to show in different ways how great the project is. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you watch it, you get it. You're like, great, it's awesome. But having those accolades, they help. There's no two ways about it. So it is really awesome. We got these awards and nominations. That's really amazing. And each one just feels like, such a little ego boost that you're like, oh my God, this is so hard I'm working so many hours on this and someone appreciated it. Yeah. Um, and it's something for marketing that people are like, oh, okay, this is one more thing on the resume, on the website of this project. Um, and then I would say maybe even more important is when you get selected, you get to go to these festivals and now you're meeting a lot of interesting people. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, as an actress and meeting a bunch of filmmakers who are seeing me on the big screen and maybe they're going to want to work with me in the future. Um, as a writer, I'm meeting a ton of directors that maybe I want to work with as a producer, same thing. Um, so you're meeting your future colleagues, which is what happened with imposter. You know, I met my producer when I was at a festival with a short film. And then, um, like I said, forever student, I love me a panel. So I'll be there front row. Who are these panelists? And let the networking take off, you know? So you get to meet all these professionals that it would be difficult to have access to them. And now you're at a festival where you already have a built-in credibility because you are a part of the roster of the filmmakers of the festival. So you're not coming in as someone who is a total stranger reaching out with a cold email. Now it's like, mm-hmm. hey, I'm here with a film. You can see it on the big screen. So that's already a plus. And you already know I was good, en- I was good enough, you know, quote unquote, to be here. Let's talk. And so even thinking about furthering your career, now you have all these uh, people you can talk to and make that happen versus just being at home and having a great project in your hands that no one has seen, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's no, that's awesome that, you know, and encouraging for filmmakers that there are doors that open and it's the it's not just about getting into the biggest and best festival that there's great networking opportunities all across mm-hmm. the board and that um for yourself, I I love that you talk about the different positions. So thanks for breaking that down. Like what it shows, how it showcases you as an actor versus, and then versus a writer versus director. There's so many ways and it's just like a great portfolio piece that even though if it can't just like strictly sell, it's selling you in all these various avenues. So yeah. I think that's that's a really important distinction and... I mean, yeah, that was going to be my question was for distribution because it's an episodic, you know, or web series episodic where it's going to be an episodic. Um, Mm -hmm. It is that it's it is a little tricky to navigate. And I'm so impressed by because this is the first project I've seen that I was like, whoa, this is full on like a mini like episodic season of a Mm -hmm. of a show that I could see on Netflix so it's brilliantly done in that way that it, like for me as an audience viewer, I'm like, I, I get to see the whole art. We talked, we touched on that. So how do you feel like you're going to go about pitching it to someone? And if yeah. you are, I assume you are, you should. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, you know, it, it, that's just so well set up for you there that would yeah. it be um, kind of developing each episode more and adding more story arcs so how how would you like I'm just curious how do you vision yeah. if you're moving forward if there was like mm-hmm. a deal on the table yeah no absolutely I think there's different avenues we're trying to hit kind of at the same time so um it would be really nice to sell it as it is like make some little money back you know put it somewhere where people can see it amazing so that's something we're looking into <laughs> uh, also would be great to remake it with a great streaming platform and like okay mm-hmm. let's remake it with the millions now um so that's something we're also looking to to pitch it 
Um, so that's the kind of the, the two ways that we can use this is we can sell the project itself and we can use it like we talked about before as a proof of concept to show how can this be a full TV show. Um, so that's yeah. kind of the two prong approach. And then at the same time, there's a third approach that we're also exploring, which is uh, putting it on YouTube and doing a really robust ad campaign so that it hits as many eyeballs as possible. And that way, kind of like with the festival circuit conversation, we're getting it in front of as many people as possible. We never know who is watching it. And right. again, that's a marketing tool you can use of like, these are the amount of people who watched it. So there is an audience for it. Therefore, do you want to buy the idea? Yeah. Um, so that was always my thought process behind it. I want the critical acclaim. So like the festival awards to say this is good quality. Mm -hmm. And I want the numbers to showcase that this is commercially viable. So those are the two ideas. And at the same time, yes, let's go out and pitch it to just sell it as it is. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And, you know, like you were saying earlier, Carolina, it's like a, a web series is um, it's it's still new media. Like it's even though it's not a new thing, it's in its own little kind mm -hmm. of gray area. So you yeah, it, that's kind of a blessing is that you have these different options and different approaches that you could do with it. It's not just a traditional like you're looking for a distributor kind of deal like a feature film, maybe. Yeah, I think even. Uh, first of all, thank you for being so candid about that and, and breaking it down. Um, we try to, you know, spill the tea on the show as we do. <laughs> so thanks for spilling it, girl, because that was very, I think, a smart way of I think even if you have a feature like ours, we're still mm -hmm. faced with the same challenges. It doesn't, right. it's, it, like you said, one plus one doesn't always equal two in this mm -hmm. scenario, but we're still like, as an independent filmmaker, we're still left with these question marks of, okay, is it better to do to, for us to get more eyeballs on it ourselves if we're pushing all the marketing and just self distribute yeah. on a platform like Vimeo, like YouTube. Yeah. Um, or yeah, try to sell it to streamers. So I think the lesson here for, for what I'm hearing is that you just always need a plan A, plan B, plan C, and kind of mm -hmm. get as much information back from the people you're speaking to, the, Absolutely. the kind of the debt, if you have data, like, wow, we put up this trailer, I don't know, a little sizzle or something, <clears throat> and it blew up on YouTube. Like, oh shit, we tested that. That's a market. I think, again, like what we were talking about, even just trying to do a campaign, it's so easy to just want to move forward and get the deal done. And like, that's it. Be but done with it. In yeah. this phase, be done with it. But even in this phase, it's important to weigh out your options, test things out, do the research, because even in our position, there, there's got to be mul there are multiple ways of going about it and you kind of have to plan and have different strategies right different ways of mm -hmm. going about it so yeah I, I I just you know we we all have to do that kind of work and mm -hmm. think about it in that way and not rush that process so I love that mm -hmm. you've you've you got your strategies you've got your outlets and options and I'm just really excited because it's it's going to land somewhere amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Fingers crossed. Yes. Oh, yeah, girlfriend. <laughs> so congrats. Keep going. Congrats to your team. Also, shout out to Diversity. <laughs> and um, you should apply for the Reframe Stamp Award if you haven't. Um, I have not. I will we'll send you the application oh, after the show. Um, for anyone who isn't listening, our feature film was awarded the reframe stamp um, of yeah, gender congrats. balance Thank equity you. on set. So it's about gender equity in production and showcasing, you know, a gender balance set, diverse creators all working together. That's been our number one mission, mission of Femregard Productions. So mm -hmm. it was honored, an honor to be shown and awarded with that. Um, yeah, that's what we're also about. So, well, yay! Awesome. <laughs> no, thank you for that, Rick. I'll definitely look into it.
Yeah. And so just to wrap up for our listeners, um, they can't quite watch Imposter yet, but if they mm-hmm. want to follow the project and follow your journey and anything that's coming up, uh, please let them know mm-hmm. where they can do that. As well as yeah. if you do have any festivals coming up that anyone can attend, let us know about that as well. Yes. So I would say the most updated place where you can find uh, news and updates is Instagram uh, at imposter the series. I'm also quite active on Instagram at Veronica underscore Makari. Um, we have a website where you can get information about the project, which is uh, Um If you want to get our newsletter, you can follow us on the Seed and Spark page. Just look up Imposter the Series. We do kind of notify folks of the next festivals, put links for tickets. So that's always fun. Um, And yeah, the next festivals, we have a a few coming up. We have Lighthouse Film Festival in Long Island Beach, New Jersey next week. And our uh, screening is on Sunday, June 8th. I'm not mistaken that June 8th is a Sunday, 12.30 p.m. Um, And then we are screening at the Valley Film Festival in North Hollywood in August. We don't know quite yet the date, but it's between August 1st and August 8th. I will personally be there. So come and say hi and be our friend. Um, Yeah. So these are the ones that are coming to mind. I think there's another couple that I'm forgetting. But if you go on our Instagram, I laid it out there. I put the links for tickets. You're all set. Amazing. Well, congratulations. Like, that's so exciting. So much going on for this project. Thank you. We're very excited too. And it's always super fun to show it on the big screen and then meet more people who are like you guys who are like, oh my God, let's talk about it. And I'm a filmmaker too and all of that. Yes. Yeah. So happy we're able to connect <laughs> and, and have you on the show today. Also, your I think spark in our connection was me commenting on how bomb your trailer looked so guys you can definitely watch the trailer (laughs) (laughs) i'm like hey hello Mm -hmm. they'll make your friend um and that's that's how it that's how it gets done yeah that's how it gets done so yes i forgot youtube yes i literally there's so many platforms i forgot the most important one linkedin linkedin LinkedIn. Yeah. So LinkedIn, you will find me posting stuff and you can go to the YouTube page of Imposter the Series. There's the trailer. So you can see something. And you know, a little it looks taste. Good. And it looks yes. really good. So thank you. be sure to follow around, fam. And thank you again, Veronica, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Super fun to talk to you guys. And I can't wait to see your feature. I'm <gasps> really stoked. <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to FemRegard Podcast. If you like what you hear, tune in every Friday for more tips on the filmmaking business and insightful conversations with industry professionals. We can only grow with your support, so please subscribe, share, rate, and review. You can also join the Fem Fam on Patreon. For more on us, check us out at femregard.com. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.